We've just heard Alexius Ohanian talk about platform thinking, and so there I'd, therefore I'd love to introduce to you Sangeet Paul Chowdhury. Sanji Paul Chowdhury is the Managing Director of Platform Thinking Labs, known for his work on platform business models and network effects. He's an entrepreneur in residence at the International Business School in C. Mr Chowdhury is a widely published industry analyst and advisor to CEOs and other top-level executives. His work has been featured or recommended by The Wall Street Journal, Harvard Business Review and Forbes. Gentlemen, we have three continents represented, excluding mine. Can you each tell us about the current trends in digital disruption from your perspective? What are you seeing? Yeah, I, I want to take a geography agnostic perspective on that. There are two large trends that I'm seeing globally happening right now. Uh, the first is that for the first time ever, entrepreneurs can create entirely new markets. Traditionally, entrepreneurs have uh, innovated by creating a better product or a better service, but we're seeing entrepreneurs creating entirely new markets. Airbnb, for example, is an alternate market for accommodation. Uh, it's not a better hotel, it's just a totally different alternate market for accommodation. Elan Sodesk is an alternate market for hiring. LinkedIn is an alternate market for recruitment. Um, and so we're repeatedly seeing this rise of alternate markets. Uh, even if you think of something like YouTube, it's an alternate market for uh, content where you're buying content with your attention and so on. Uh, so the power that entrepreneurs have because of that is way higher than it ever was because you can reach multi-billion dollar scale in a much shorter time purely because you're orchestrating both supply and demand simultaneously. You're no longer the person producing the supply, so you're no longer inhibited for scale, but network effects help you reach that scale much faster. So that's the first pretty much global trend that I see. <clears throat> Excuse me. The second big trend that I see is uh, uh, the, the shift of companies from thinking in terms of products to seeing products as a way for getting data in and then delivering services based on that data. Uh, an example of that is ne the Nest thermostat. Traditionally, a thermostat would just be a product and you would sell the thermostat and you'd be done. Nest business starts at the time that the thermostat sells. After that, it gathers the data. Using that, it provides services back to the consumer, to third parties. And increasingly, uh, I'm seeing this happening in different industries that I uh, work with with Fortune 100 companies that I work with, which traditionally you would, not have, you would have thought of as the disrupted, but now they're thinking so that they can disrupt themselves in, in, in this fashion. We often cite um, the really um, obvious, well, they're obvious in hindsight, business models like Uber or, you know, and fixing a broken industry like the taxi industry. Where are some of the lesser known areas of digital disruption that you're seeing, some of the more surprising areas? The less visible forms of disruption, um, to, to extend what Josh was talking about, one of, uh, one of the most common patterns of less visible disruption is simply the intermediation or disintermediation of an industry that is refusing to be disintermediated. So if you think of what has been disintermediated, it's been media, telecom, uh, information intensive industries. Uh, but there are many other information intensive industries like banking, education, healthcare, just more regulated and where the costs of participating in a faulty transaction are so high that you wouldn't want to participate in an alternate market. So I believe that there's disruption happening on the fringes in financial services, for example, with peer-to-peer -peer lending. So that's a whole area that is less visible today. Another area that's fairly less visible right now is the reorganization of supply chains uh, on networks. So we, this, uh, the first real example of reorganization of supply chains on networks is Wikipedia because the whole writing, editing, uh, consumption, everything got reorganized on a network. But there's uh, startups like Quirky coming out which allow the design, the manufacturing, and the selling entirely on a network model. And with the rise of 3D printing, I believe that this will b become even more pervasive. So again, this is again happening in the fringes. A, a third model that I see which is really not visible at this point is resource-intensive, non-information industries organizing themselves around networks, digital networks. And GE made a big um, uh, s sort of a theme around this with the industrial internet, which is connect all your machines and 
add data, a layer of data on top of your machines and you have a new form of value. We're seeing this happening in mining and oil and gas and very resource intensive industries, but still at the fringes. So these are three things which I believe will happen a lot in the coming days, but we're seeing very initial signs of these on the fringes right now. Senge, you, um, I'm going to come back to your point. You talk about um, digital disruption requiring scale, um, which in turn relies on network effect. Do we need a global perspective, therefore, in order to have an effective platform, or can we localize, and can we get localized network effects? Sure. So um, to, to qualify the point about scale, I, I believe there are two parts <laughs> to scale. You need to scale value creation, which is where network effects are very important, and you need to scale um, operations, the operating model, which is where uh, and a model that is not very, very resource intensive, it becomes very important. What we see with, with a lot of platforms is even though today they may look like multi-billion dollar behemoths, most of them started by focusing on something very specific. Um, they, it might not always be a geographic locality, but it would be something very specific. The, the biggest, the, the, the platform with the largest network effects today, possibly Facebook, started by focusing on Harvard University. You can't get more local than that. And there are certain other platforms which benefit from network effects, which are inherently local. If you think of an Uber, you mm -hmm. have to launch city by city. You can't uh, book a car in another city using Uber. So. Um, it, it, it does start locally, yes. So there is wisdom then in starting small and not necessarily setting out to conquer the world. Absolutely. Uh, the, the, whole, uh, the, the challenge with network effects is that you need to have a, lo a lot of concentration of supply and demand at any point. So mm -hmm. if you, when you start, if you, if you start by targeting the whole world, if Facebook had 1,000 users on day one spread across the world, there would be no interactions. But because they were all in one location and they knew each other, there were interactions. One of the things that gets talked about a lot when it comes to digital dis disruption is the change in workforce. Um, you know, jobs will be at risk, we need a total new skill set, capability set, um, we're teaching our kids currently skills that are going to be totally irrelevant in five years' time, let alone in 10 or 15. Can you each speak into that? What are the, what are the skills of the future that we need and what jobs are most at risk? Yes, so I, I have a very specific point of view on that. Um, which is centered around how networks are changing the world today, how network platforms are reorganizing the world. And very often, what happens in media sort of becomes a pattern for what happens in other industries, because media, given how information intensive it is and how unregulated it is, gets disrupted first. So what I believe will happen a lot is the coexistence of very niche and fragmented small companies, maybe solopreneurs, free agents, around large platforms that allow them market access. So we already see this happening in the media and advertising side of things. Uh, if you see the whole ecosystem of media houses run by 18-year-olds on YouTube, who are making a lot of money, by the way, it's an, it's an example of a whole ecosystem of very fragmented niche brands building themselves on top of large global platforms. And I believe that as this moves from pure digital to physical, digital, but networked models like Airbnb, for example, we'll also need services that bridge the offline and the online. So if you think of how Airbnb works, there's a lot of things that happen online which help the host and the traveler connect, but everything that happens after that, who, who delivers the key, who cleans up the apartment, all of these lend themselves to services companies that can aggregate this service across multiple hosts and a whole new range of jobs can be created. So there's a lot of, uh, I know this is a big theme for the G20, and there's a lot of pessimism that machines are taking away jobs, but I believe that software is only reorganizing the world. It's not removing humans. It's just reorganizing and making processes more efficient. And what we need to do is figure out which assembly line, supply chain, traditional jobs are going to go out, and what new kinds of jobs will the networked economy offer. So that's how I, I, I think about this. What are you each most excited about when it comes to what you see into the, in the future for digital disruption? No, no surprises here. I'm, I'm most excited about the fact that I, I believe that a lot of things across different industries will get organized around digital platforms, network platforms. And uh, we're already seeing this. And whenever somebody is trying to build the Uber for X or the Airbnb for Y, they're, they're also trying to bet on that same thing, that there's something else that can be done in a certain industry. It, it may not always be just copying something that works and tweaking a few things. Uh, it, it's a lot of 
this reorganization may come from the from the big leaders, from the Nike and Gs of the world, rather than from a, a startup that's in a garage today. But but one way or the other, I believe that business is going to be organized around network platforms, and that's what I'm most excited about. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time for a break. We've got approximately 20 minutes, and when you when it is time to come back in, you get the opportunity to enjoy another panel conversation with honestly two, well, there's four people, but I've already had the joy of talking with two of them. They will blow your minds about the, um, the impact of policy on f furthering and fostering entrepreneurship and growth. You will hear bells when it's time to come in, so that is your cue to come back in and join the conversation. But as you leave the room, would you please help me in thanking our panelists this evening. Thank you.